section one, two, section one, two. Can you guys hear me? Good. Romans chapter five is where our meditation will be as we continue to work through a glorious anthology of truth given to us by the Apostle Paul. We have entitled this year's journey, The Pilgrim's Progress, as I have endeared my heart to want to make sure many of you understand the historical as well as personal journey of the child of God uh, and its relationship to the efforts and labors of our master, the Lord Jesus, and his apostles. What does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to know the gospel? What does it mean to live by its power and grace in this dispensation between grace and what? Glory. Grace and glory. This is where we are. And the Apostle Paul is really laying out some technical things uh, in the in lieu of the celebration that we saw last week, coming off of an argument on the doctrine of justification as we have in verse 1. And I've shared with you justification is the process by which a person is declared what? Righteous. Got to learn. Got to learn. Righteousness is the consequence of justification. When a man is right with God, God can prove it. Whatever grounds they may, be, they may to be, be declared to be righteous, declared righteous something, has something has happened in the courtroom, in of, the God, courtroom of God, by which by all which of God's all demands, of God's and, demands law and law has been so, has satisfied, been so satisfied on the part on the of part that person who is declared, who declared righteous, righteous that they that enjoy they the, benefits the benefits of absolute fellowship with God. We closed out last week looking at the optic of a man named Mephibosheth, if you guys recall, sitting at the table of fellowship with David, King David, when in fact the whole of Mephibosheth's genealogy and lineage was at war with the lineage of David. Mephibosheth was actually an enemy of David, and yet he's at the table of fellowship enjoying what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 5, verse 11, and these words are what he declares, and not only so, but we also, what? Joy in God. We find our rejoicing in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the what? Now, the word atonement there should be better translated for the word reconciliation. It is the term that's used in the whole of the previous verse. Look at verse 10. Romans 5, verse 10 will explain this for us. As we get there, for when we were enemies, we were what? Reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more than being what? Reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. And then Paul concludes in verse 11, in the courtroom of the conscience of men on the behalf of God. And not only so, not only are we aware that we have been reconciled, brought back into favor by the death of God's son, we having been reconciled, shall be saved by his life. Those are glorious terms. And then he concludes in verse 11, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received this reconciliation, by whom we have been brought back into favor with God. So we were to deal with it again syllogistically, being reconciled back to God is a consequence of the atonement being accomplished, the means by which God's anger towards us was satisfied by the death of Christ. The atonement then grants justification, and justification grants reconciliation. You and I are brought back into fellowship with God, but only through who? Jesus Christ. That's where our joy is, child of God. Our joy in God is because of our mediator. Jesus is the grounds by which you can be exceedingly happy that God sees you in his favor. That is something you want to anchor down into your soul deeply and consistently. As I've shared with you before, as a child of God, you can become comfortable with the notion that as you think about yourself, you will frequently think about yourself in disconnection to Jesus. And in so doing, you lose the benefit of who you really are in Christ. I want you to capture that idea. A lot of Christians are actually operating 
uh, in the non-benefit, in the absence of the blessing of being in union with Jesus. To the degree that you can train your mind to know that everything that he is, what you are in him, and everything that you are, he was for you. That union will keep you from getting in trouble in your own self-perception disconnected from Christ. And so this would be an area of a walk of faith that I would definitely encourage you in. Learn what it means to be in union with Jesus because Jesus was in union with you long before you were in union with him. Now that he has tapped you on your shoulder and said, have fellowship with me, he wants you to walk with him in a deep, comprehensive, sustained knowledge that everything that you are, you are, you are in him. And everything that he is, you are also in him. That, that, that combination, we call it union with Christ, is really the heart of Pauline theology. Now what Paul does from here in verse 11, celebrating, this is what he meant by we joy in God. This infers that we understand our salvation deeply enough to constantly drink from the well of grace in a way in which as we contemplate all that he is and all that he did, there are going to be very few times in your life that you really are troubled with what it means to joy in God. When you really understand the fullness, the panoply of blessings that come in Christ, there won't really be anything in your life that can mitigate that sincerely. What can come against you that can overthrow God's promises in your life? What can take place in your immediate circumstances that can tell you or persuade you that the long-term goal of God for you is eternal glory and eternal bliss? Are y'all hearing what I'm getting at? I'm getting at the, at the idea that you need to be exercising your faith in the area of all that Jesus is and all that Jesus did because that's who you are in him. And to the degree that you fail to comprehend this, and you can, you can know where you fail to comprehend it, it's when you get in trouble and you begin to sink and you begin to lose sight of and you begin to feel like you're by yourself like you're struggling through these issues and there's no one there. But obviously, if you're a child of God, you're lying to yourself. Wouldn't that be true? I mean, if the Father is with you and the Son is with you and the Holy Ghost is with you, remember, we know that tear, don't we? We know that the Father is cardinal one. The Lord Jesus is the mediator. And the Holy Ghost is the e-mediator. He's the one that connects you to the other two. And his job is not to leave you alone. And so why do we feel alone? Why do we feel abandoned? Why do we feel by ourselves? Why do we often feel like we're dealing with an issue without any help? It's because we fail to keep the mindfulness of who we are in Christ and therefore call upon him in the time of trouble to help us when we are sinking. Making sense, right? All right, so the title of our, our study today, the title of our message today is gonna kind of help us. Look at what it says, the Pilgrim's Progress, Rock, reconciled, that is brought back into favor, reconciled only where? In Christ. There is no other reconciliation for humanity apart, apart from Jesus. Now what I'm going to do here is work a little bit in breaking up the follow ground of your alienation with biblical concepts. I have to do this because if I assume that you know, then it's going to be a disadvantage to you if you don't know. When we talk about reconciliation, we are inferring that our world is alienated from God. When we talk about reconciliation, we are inferring <clears throat> that our world acts as an enemy against God. That would be true, would it not? When we're talking about reconciliation, we are viewing the world as having divorced God from being God and has chosen to do life on its own. Thank you. We don't need God. When we consider reconciliation, we're considering that the world not only not wants God, but the world is at war with God. That is your Bible, by the way. That is your Bible, right? The natural man, as Paul is going to talk about, the carnal mind in Romans chapter 6, uh, 7, or 8, rather, is enmity against God. And so you and I all have an aversion to God uh, in, in the early stages of our consciousness because we are by nature three things in Romans chapter 5. We are ungodly, we are sinners, 
and we're enemies of God. That's, that's Romans 5. They've been rejoicing all through Romans 5. I'm talking Paul and the church at Rome and everybody that knows the gospel. How can you rejoice when God calls you ungodly? Because in your ungodliness, he commends Christ to you. How can you rejoice when God calls you a sinner? Because when he calls you a sinner, he says Christ died for sinners. How can you rejoice when God tells you you're an enemy of God? He said, even while we were enemies of God, he reconciled us in the body of Christ through death. See, that's a paradoxical joy, isn't it? It's like God is insulting you. He's really not. He's just telling you the truth. We've already heard the court case, have we not, children of God? We've already understood the divine injunction. Do you know what it is? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all in a mess, are we not? And so when God comes along and just simply tells you what you are, the thing you want to do is agree with him because he has a solution to your problems. He says, come, let us reason together. Even though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Now, when God has the answer to your problem, your job is to sit down and have a cup of coffee with him and listen to him. So when our text tells us reconciliation only comes in Christ, what he's about to do now is take us way back to the beginning. We're going to be dealing with some technical stuff, but I'm, I'm hoping that God is opening your ears around this right now because he's taking us back to the beginning. He's saying that if we are enemies of God, if we have been made hostile to God, if there's a break in the relationship, the question will be is, well, when did that happen? When did that happen? And now we want to do theology under point number one. Let's begin to work this through. Under point number one, return to favor in Christ. This is my argument in verses 11, which comes out of verse 3. And returning to favor in Christ is a comprehensive thing that God is doing. Look at sub point A. I want to make these two categories clear. There is what is called in the Bible a general reconciliation of everything. A general reconciliation of everything. What does that mean, Pastor? It means when Christ died on the cross, God made him Lord of all. And from that moment, Jesus has been in the process of reconciling everything to himself. Do you guys know that language? Again, it's going to be for you and I in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, because I want you to get the vision. He is reconciling everything to himself, not only as we're about to see human beings, but everything. Jesus is in the process of bringing everything back into order and into harmony and into unity with himself and with his father. You see, it all came apart at the fall. And as it began to disintegrate, God had a plan to recover it. The gospel is a recovery plan. And so when you and I hear the idea of reconciliation, it's the reconstitution or the recovery of things broken and lost. And our whole universe is broken and lost. Paul will make this plain in Romans 8. But listen to what uh, Paul says to the church at Ephesus. Having made known unto us, us here can be <clears throat> any believer, any uh, biblically informed human being. You can, uh, you can include yourself in this. Having made known to us, that's what the gospel does, the mystery of his what? Now the word will is always a synonym for the gospel particularly at the fifth category of the will of God. We talked last week about the sovereignty of God. We talked about the secret will of God. We talked about the preceptive will of God. We talked about the permissive will of God. And then we talk about what is called the redemptive will of God. The redemptive will of God is the way Jesus expressed it when he came. I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's the redemptive will of God. You guys follow me? And so Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 37, explicitly, this is the will of him that sent me, that all that he has given me, I should lose none, but raise it up at the last day. So the gospel is about the will of God at the redemptive level. Y'all got that? At the redemptive. There's more aspects to his will Everything is subsumed under the sovereign will of God. Nothing happens that God hasn't determined or allowed or purposed. Nothing happens apart from his sovereign will. Am I making some sense? And we're going to drill down into that here in a moment. But listen to what he says. 
going back to, um, to Ephesians 1, 9. Have he made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure wherein he hath purposed in himself. That's God. I love this language. This is a reflexive verb, and this will help you a little bit too. Can I, can I just kind of share this with you? When God is talking to himself, it's not because he has schizophrenia. I just want you to get that. But he does talk to himself. Because he is not a unipersonal God, he is a tri-personal God. And what that means is the Father talks to the Son, and the Son talks to the Father, and the Holy Ghost talks to the Son, and the Son talks to the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost talks to the Father, so that all three bear witness among themselves, fulfilling the Hebrew mandate. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be what? Established. So whenever God determines something, it's already born by three as a witness, because they all three agree in one. Am I teaching you something? So now, when you go through the Bible and you see God always talking about himself, he's not narcissistic, although he could be. He's the only one in the world that is worthy of talking about himself. So don't be mad at him. You can join in with him because as a child of God, you get to own the glory. But here's what he says in verse 10, and I want you to capture the thought before we go on, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, now that phrase dispensation simply means the outworking of human history according to the will of God, okay? That Sensation of the fullness of time, he might do what? Gather together in one all things in Christ. See what God is doing? He's gathering everything together in one in Christ. God is bringing things back into proper perspective. Now, you might not see it. I might not see it. It may be way bigger than our sense of proportion in our sense of perception. It may be way beyond your ability to recognize how God is doing it. Nevertheless, he said that's what he's doing. All right, so I'm going to put a little parenthetical around that for a moment to kind of help you. Imagine you were there in the beginning. That's where we're going. We're getting ready to deal with the fall. And imagine you knew what the world was like before the fall. You don't. But imagine if you did. You can't. But imagine if you could. <laughs> Now, I'm going to tell you why in a minute that you can't. You just can't because, like, when you're on the outside, you can't ever know until you're on the inside. And we ain't never been on the inside. we all been window shopping. And I've already told you, the suit is different when you look at it in the window than when you put it on. Right. right? And so you and I don't know a whole lot about what it means to be sinless. But imagine being in a sinless state like Adam and Eve and then having to be removed from that glorious, pristine, paradisio scenario into the world of thorns and thistles and briars and problems. We know that part of the world, don't we? We know the world of pain, of sinfulness, of brokenness, of sorrow, of anger, of war and conflict. That's the only world we know. This is the paradox for us. We have hope for glory, but we live in a practical hellish scenario, do we not? And we know more about pain and more about suffering and more about disappointment than we do about glory. And yet we have that hope in us. We have that hope. Then imagine what the world was like in the days of Adam and Eve, tens of thousands of years ago, and how over the course of history, the eons of history, the world got worse. And you can imagine that Adam and Eve or maybe the days of Noah or even maybe the days of Abraham because it's been almost 4,000 years. It has been almost 4,000 years between Abraham and us. The world has gotten increasingly worse, has it not? Now, I want to say one thing about it. The world has been going through ebbs and flows. That's how God works. It seems to get better here and there, and then actually it does precipitously drop into a dark place. We are in a dark place right now, are we not? In all honesty, we're in a dark place. But believers have always had to travel through dark places. We've had to live in dark places. We've had to suffer dark trials. We've had to endure dark spaces. We had to uh, live often with dark people, and we were dark ourselves. 
That's the journey outside of the paradisial state. This is what God is saying in Christ, that he is actually organizing things to bring them back together in a way that ultimately there will be what is called a restoration. That being said, I want to try to persuade you of one little snippet around what I just said, which might sound like a contradiction, but it's nothing but a paradox. You guys know what that is, right? Paradoxes and contradictions are two different things. They're just two realities, two laws that appear opposite, but they work together separate. It's called an anomaly. All right, on the one hand, the world is really bad. On the other hand, men and women have experienced exponential blessings of which previous generations could never, ever even imagine. Am I making sense? I mean, just think about it. Think about it, saints. Think about it now. This used to horrify me when I got, first got saved. You know what I, I learned? It wasn't that long ago before we didn't even have anesthesia for the, uh, anesthetics, uh, anesthetics for the dentist to pull you. Now, I'm being a little humorous, but there are many things like that that you and I have to be thankful for in the 21st century. Yet, on the other hand, we are becoming much more sociological, sociologically uh, in adapt to relationships, much more inclined to averse relationships, dysfunctional relationships, and all kinds of pathologies, we've talked about it before, that make our present generation and season a very dark place. Is that not true? The tension between the two, the believer has to hold. Uh, if you don't get anything else, get this. If you're in Christ, your job is to hold the tension of the things that are good and the things that are bad. You hold that tension. You don't live in all good. That's a delusion. And you don't live in all bad. That's depressing. You and I hold in tension the good and the bad. That's what the proverb says, okay? The proverb says, in the day of prosperity, rejoice. And in the day of adversity, consider. Because both of them happen all the time at once, sequentially, or after the other. You're just going to have good days, and you're going to have what? Bad days. Hold them together and find the proportion. This is why grounded believers can rejoice in a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world, because we can hold it in proportion. Am I making sense? This is why Paul can say in Romans chapter 5, we glory in tribulation. Because we glory in Christ. Because in Christ we have overcome the world. What a perspective. And yet we talk about it here at Grace, and I hope you get this. We don't play the kind of church where you say words without weighing them. Because it's one thing to say we glory in tribulation. Until you get out in the parking lot and find out you got a flat tire. Now we're watching you. Where the glory at? Now we're watching you. Where, where the glory at? Am I making sense? So you and I have to be careful to know how to rejoice, even when we're suffering, and know how to keep our hope and optimism, even when there doesn't seem to be any of that going on. This is really the task of the believer walking by faith. You will be much more successful in your life if you can do it. Are you hearing me? All right, so then under point number one, what we see by Paul's language is God is reconciling, reconciling all things, all things material, non-personal, all of the cosmos is under a kind of reconstruction process. He would argue that more fully in Ephesians 1. But look with me at our second subpoint. Not only is there a general reconciliation of everything, there is a particular reconciliation of the what? A particular reconciliation of the elect. No one who knows their Bible for five minutes should ever argue that God has an elect. Because if you're saved, you are saved because God chose you unto salvation. And being chosen unto salvation is being elected of God. Did you hear what I just stated? Right. And so it's, we're not going to argue that doctrine. It's just stupid for people to assert that God doesn't have an election plan. I mean, some folks are going to hell and some folks are going to glory. The Bible's clear about that. And the only reason you're going to glory is because God chose you because you didn't choose him. By the time you said yes to God, he had already said yes for you. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah. All right, we give him the glory for tapping us on the shoulder, don't we? Yeah. Now, listen to how the Ephesians book puts it. This is Ephesians 1, 11. I want you to capture this. 
in Ephesians 1.11, this is what he says, in whom, that's Jesus, Jesus is always here, the antecedent, he's the pronoun here, in Jesus we have obtained and what? We have obtained, that's one reason to be happy. You used to be broke spiritually. Now you are infinitely wealthy with the inheritance that you have in Christ. Notice what he says, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being what? You are predestinated because you were chosen. You were chosen unto an inheritance by God selecting you out and showing you what Jesus did for you and qualifying you to agree with the terms. Notice what he says. In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose. That can also be will, because we'll see it at the end of the verse. According to the purpose of him who works a few things after the counsel of his own will. Do you see it? So Pauline theology always has as the substratum or foundation of all propositions that God is sovereign. Pauline th theology never views God as out of the conversation, out of the picture, or out of control. So things are happening, but they are happening according to the what? Sovereign will of God. That's what he's saying here, is he not? Notice then. Everything is working after the council, after the council. I want to circle back for a moment. The council of God, where is that? That's between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three agree in one. Y'all keeping up with me? Right. According to the council of his own will. There it is for any of you that needs it. This is what he's expressing that he has purpose to do this. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12 as he works it through. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Walk this through. This is what happens. You and I believe the gospel and it's designed for us to be to the praise of his glory. In whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you believe you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul is moving us in a direction to begin to understand what God has done for us. Verse 14. Notice what he says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, that whole construction there can be understood as this. God purposed you as his possession. He came to you and gave you a down payment assurance that you're his. That down payment assurance is the Holy Ghost. He's the seal that lets you know that God promises to bring you into everlasting joy with him when you die or when he comes again. Am I making some sense? You and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We are God's property, and what that means is you are on your way to the destination. And we use the analogy of FedEx and UPS. On that box, there's a stamp. And that box describes who you and I are as we are making our way to glory. And the stamp on that box is the stamp of a sovereign God who has sealed you by his spirit to protect the contents of your soul so that you are not damaged between here and there. You are God's property. Am I making some sense? You are God's property. It's important for you to know that. That's the, that's the language because he's reconciling us to himself too. I want to make sure we understand this a little bit more technically as well. John chapter 10, verse 15. Here's what Jesus said, and you believe this because this is what has happened to you if you're a child of God. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 15. Jesus says, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. That is a subject-object relationship. You know what that means? Jesus is not the Father, and the Father's not Jesus. Jesus knows the Father, and the Father knows Jesus. Y'all got that? You understand that? That's a subject-object relationship. Watch this now. So know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the what? Are you his sheep? Then Christ laid down his life for you. This was a negotiation between the Father and the Son. Now watch what the next verse says. Notice what it says. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. What is he talking about? He's talking to his Jewish brethren right now about the redemption that him and his father purposed before the world began. Jesus came as the good shepherd and is gathering his sheep from the Jewish fold, is he not? 
And he's saying that not only do I have a fold of the Jewish ethnos, but I also have a fold of all the other ethnoses. They must be brought in as well. Listen to the language. And they shall hear my voice. Hold it. We go back to the second clause. Them also I must what? Them also I must what? Right, and so I have to stop here and tell you that when you discovered that Jesus was Lord, it was because he hunted you down and brought you back from the brink of hell and revealed his glory to you. That's the work of the shepherd. You and I were like lost sheep wandering the world, ignorant of God, ignorant of Christ, and as a good shepherd, he came to get you, and he gets you through the gospel. Notice what he says. Them also I must bring, and they shall what? And they shall what? Please mark that, child of God. What gets you from here to glory is you have been given an ear to hear your shepherd. Because like any dumb sheep, the sheep is only as dumb as they forget that they actually need their shepherd. Right? So we are dumb a lot, aren't we? But the reality is, is that you're made to listen to Jesus. You're made to listen to the word of God. You're made to listen to and comprehend, understand, and love the gospel because the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. Am I making some sense? Right, and notice what he says here. He says, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one what? That's what Jesus is doing right now, gathering his people from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Is he not doing this? You and I can visualize that. This is why we love technology, because just a short while ago, you and I could never visualize what God was doing in all the nations. We can only hear about it, but you and I can see it now on the big screen. We can see people from all of the different ethnoses who love our Savior and love his word and love his gospel and serve him and suffer for him and wait on him. Can we not? So Jesus can't lie, fill, or change. He has brought to pass what you and I are experiencing is presently the reconciliation. All right, point number two, the harder work to go to. So I want you to celebrate with this reality. You're probably never going to go anywhere in the world and not meet a believer. That's because God is working out the reconciliation. I've been all over the world, thank God. And in a few minutes, you run across a believer. This is not hard to understand. It's because the work that his father sent him to do is being worked out now through the apostolic mission of evangelism. And here we are, a group of men and women from all kinds of different backgrounds, and we can bob our heads in positive affirmation that Jesus is Lord. Can we not? Because he got you and he got me. He came and sought us and saved us and sanctified us even to the point where we can hear the gospel as we are today. Let's go into some difficult work. I hope to make it just fundamentally plain, but it is profoundly technical and extremely complex, and it can lose you. But just let's see what God will do for us. Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 12. The Apostle Paul then building on his celebratory argument of, uh, of reconciliation says, Wherefore... As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all, for all have sinned. Right. If you went to public school, this verse is hard for you. Because this verse has a lot of clauses in it. And we don't talk like that in, in normal English parlance. Am I making some sense? And every clause has to be understood independently and coordinately. You have to break every clause down to be able to go, okay, Paul, I get you. Listen to it again. Paul says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. That's a clause. And death by sin. That's another clause. And so death passed upon all men. That's yet another clause. For that all men have sinned. We call that in rhetoric a syllogism. You guys got that? In, in, in rhetoric, this is syllogism. In, in apologetics as well. The presupposition that Paul is laying out is that humanity is a group of sinful people. That's what justification is all about. That's why we rejoice, right? He says humanity is a, a group of sinful people, and it started with one man. Y'all got that? So he's doing some history right now, and again, I, I know a lot of the technical arguments here. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to say this makes all kind of sense for one reason. Are you ready? Because the Bible said it. That's all. 
That's all. Stay with me now. You're going to have to choose whether or not you're going to trust the simplicity of Scripture about a historical event that has all kinds of ramifications to its uh, proposition. But the Bible says it all started with one man. So I'm going to build a number of arguments around the one man theory so that you and I can have an understanding of the wisdom of God in the one. The wisdom of God in the one. Right. So when God created the heavens and the earth, on the sixth day, he made man. On the sixth day, he didn't make a million different men. On the sixth day, he didn't make men and women in terms of millions. He did not make them in terms of multi-ethnic groups on the planet. On the sixth day at creation, he made one man. The one man becomes what we call the principle of first causes. This is true for every creature on the planet. It all started with one. Are you hearing me? It all started with one. And we know the language of the one man in Genesis chapter uh, 2. And that is, he made them male and female in the image of God. In other words, Eve was on the inside of Adam when Adam was first made. He was in her in principle. He was in her in prophecy. So in Genesis 1, they're called male and female. But in Genesis 2, it's only Adam. But also in Genesis 2, God puts Adam to sleep, takes a rib, and builds the woman and brings her to him. So the two now become what? One in the context of covenant. This is why we believe in marriage, do we not? The two become one. But the two were already really one. Because they were one in prophecy and they were one in purpose because Adam here is going to be for us, as the text says, a pattern of him who is to come. So you must know that when God created Adam and didn't create Eve immediately, he was teaching us something about what we know is the overarching anthem of Scripture. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it's written of me. Adam points to Jesus. Am I making sense? So let's go back to the one thing because it's important. Just as God made one man, God himself is one. Then fighting words in this world. Because everybody want to believe there's a gazillion gods. Am I making sense? One God. One God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Him only shall you hear. And this is what we believe, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? One body. Right? We believe that God is the first cause of everything. I'm actually now doing logic and argument with you. If it's created, God created it. And because he's God, he has not been created by something else. If we make God create a bowl, we will enter into an infinite regression of God's creating the gods before them. So at some point, you have to recognize everything starts with one. That's why he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's why he says, besides me, there is no other God. I agree with him. Do you? Now, there's a bunch of false gods, spurious gods, fictitious gods. There are a bunch of people that call themselves gods. Y'all know that. They got programs. I'm the God. And the Bible will say there are gazillions of gods like that. But there's only one true God. And in this sense, when he created Adam in his image, he created him in the image of his singularity of personhood. Did that make some sense? His singularity of being, singularity of being. But even in Adam, the woman was already there prophetically. Are you guys hearing me? And this is where we get the beauty of the, what we would call dual personality or dual personhood of the anthropos or of human beings. Human beings are a constituent of male and female. That's a plurality of persons. One generic human nature. Bob your head if you got it. Are you going to sleep on me? When we, go, when we talk about humanity, we are not talking about male only or female only. We're talking about men and women because they are one generically. They are individuated at the personal level. The Godhead is one generically, but they are individuated at the personal level. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Y'all got that? Right. Now, the Bible might, you might hear people call that a mystery, but that's a solution to how the Bible talks about all three persons. And what we learn, according to Paul, is that by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, he says, because all men have what? 
So if you walk that back, reverse engineer that, this will make sense. Our observation of humanity is that we all sin. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That's your Bible. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's your Bible. There's none that's seeking after God. There's none that understands. That's your Bible. All of us are born and conceived in sin. That's your Bible. Y'all following me? And even if you argue that that wasn't the case, the person that's born is eventually going to what? And because they die, that's the evidence that we're sinners. Y'all keeping up with me? I know it's boring, but I got to teach you because you don't want somebody that's smarter than you to take your Bible from you. Listen very carefully to me. Right. The evidence is that because when God created us initially, we should have been like God. He is the true and living God. God cannot die. But because we chose another God, we brought self, uh, death upon ourselves. So now we die. And it's an evidence that we are what? Sinners. Every person that hits the casket die because they're sinners. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Every person that hits the casket, we love them, but they're not, they're not perfect and they're not totally righteous. This is why we hold the tension of being simultaneously righteous and what? Because we already know we're dying, but our death is paid for and it's swallowed up in a hope called the resurrection. You agree with that? But between grace and glory, we have to admit that we are also participants in the Adamic nature, the fallen Adamic nature. We live, we get old, we die. Even when you're saved. Saved folks still die. I hope y'all know that. <laughs> right. And, and, and so follow what he says. For all have sinned because death has passed upon all. You, got, you just got to stay back at verse 12, please. For all have sinned. Because death has passed upon all. I'm going backwards. Can you see that? And death by sin came through what? One man. You see it? Now let me do a little bit more theology with you under our second point so you can become better at this. I want you to understand that we are not talking here about what is called the origin of sin. The origin of sin. We're not talking about that in terms of Adam. When we're talking about the origin of sin in terms of where sin began, sin did not begin with the fall of Adam. Sin began before the fall of Adam. This is why if you listen to the language carefully, as by one man sin began to enter into the world, no, sin entered into the world. That means sin existed before Adam opened the door to let it in. Y'all keeping up with me? Yeah. All right, I'm not going to do this long, but I got to help you because otherwise you're going to miss it. Right. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered. That means sin had to be there before it entered. All Adam did was open the door for it to come in. Come now, so theologically, it's important for you to know that sin existed prior to Adam's transgression because sin is transgression of law. That means there was a law before there was a transgression. The law before transgression is Genesis 2, 17. Yeah. In the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Stay with me. There's more to go. I know you want to run around the church. Stay with me. Keep yourself down. <laughs> Learn something. Now, God put that law there in Genesis 2, 17, if it's up there. Y'all got that? I love, I love technology. I mean, many years ago, you didn't have big screens. Now, y'all can't get away. Y'all came into church. You thought you weren't going to have the Bible read to you. It's all up in your face now. It's all in your conscience. Y'all, y'all baptize in the word of God. Stay right there because I want you to get it. Stay right there. I want you to get it. Understand what, what is going on. God is depicting himself in a particular attribute critical to our understanding. He is at the official status demonstrating his lordship over his creatures. Yes. At the official status, he's saying, I am Lord. In my house, these are the rules. Y'all got that? Uh -huh. I want you to capture that. So before he made Adam, he already had the law as a rule. He just told Adam and Eve, as you guys enjoy all the other trees, this is the one you got to leave alone. In the day you eat of that one, you shall surely what? So God is the lawgiver. James puts that very clear in James chapter 5, 1 John chapter 3. He is the lawgiver, right? And so as the lawgiver, this you must know. Before he gave the law, the law was conceived in his mind. You can't have a precept 
that you articulate without also having a blueprint of that precept before you articulate it. You can't have an expression of a legal code as a sign until you have an impression of it in the logical categories of your analysis, of your critique, of your assessment, of your judgment. In other words, the law of sin was in God's mind before it was even codified to Adam. Sin begins with God. Now, right, some of y'all get it. Now, again, I hate to say it, but I've got members who have been here for 15 years and they've captured it. Sin begins with God. If God is the first cause of everything, if he made everything and there was nothing made that he did not make, if he made it, then it had to have a blueprint behind its expression, and that blueprint is the framework of what we would call the prototype of the reality. God has to have decreed, he has to have declared, he has to have determined that sin is transgression of his law before he utters his law. Am I making sense? So sin begins with God. It begins with God as a decree. It begins with God as a law. It begins with God as a set of parameters and grounds by which there are consequences for violating it as well as benefits for observing it. He is the lawgiver. So I just want you to capture that. Now, some of you are wrestling with the notion, and I didn't say it, but your own mind said it, that if God created sin, then he must be immoral. That's no. dumb. <laughs> dumb. Get that thought out of your mind. Because there is a law that is decreed to bring about consequences for rebellion, as horrible as the consequences are, that doesn't make the lawgiver himself bad. Am I making sense? So God told his creature, Adam, hey, there's a line here. Don't cross it. If you do, there are consequences. Y'all got that? But there would be no line there if God didn't put one there. That's what verse 12, verse uh, 13 is saying in our text. Notice what it says. Go back to uh, Romans 5, 13. I want to kind of help you with this before we go on. Romans chapter 5, verse 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not what? Imputed where there is no what? All right. So Paul is assuming that you know just a little bit of Torah and you believe the history of the creation of the world and the fall of men. If you don't, this here sounds like a contradiction. It's not a contradiction at all. What Paul was saying is that the law that Israel knew as Torah with all of its precepts and all of its commands had not been given yet. What had been given was one prohibition. And that one prohibition was don't eat of the tree. Y'all keeping up with me? That was the only prohibition. Stay with me. And that one prohibition could only be violated by one person. That's Adam and Eve. No one else could violate that prohibition. Why? Because when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, the whole of their prodigy now is sinning a different way than that way. Y'all keeping up with me? It's important to get it. But what Paul would argue, as he already did back in Romans 2, 14 and 15, even though the Gentiles did not have the external law code in a book, they still had the law in their conscience and in their mind, either excusing or accusing. So here is what Paul is wanting you and I to get at. Well, why is there all this death, Paul, be, uh, between Adam and Moses? Because there was a law that was given to Adam, and that law condemned all human beings in Adam and Eve. Y'all following me? Now, this is very important because our third point is going to be talking about what we call the doctrine of federal headship. It might even be our, our second point. Let's look at it again. Look at our title. Right. Ruined in Adam, our what? Federal head. Ruined in Adam, our federal head. Let's talk about it. This is a point people argue, but you must know this. When God created Adam, technically, he created all human beings in Adam. Adam is the federal head of the whole human race. In the same way in which you and I explicitly know that Genesis 1, 26 and 27 lay out that God decreed Adam and Eve before he created Adam and then before he created Eve. 
There was the decree in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. That's the prophecy. The prophecyo is the expression, the wind blowing of God's will and counsel already being agreed upon by all three persons in the Godhead. Adam is made. Right? He made Adam out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostril the breath of life. Now we have the phenotype of God's plan in Adam the man. But we also know, because God had already told us, in Adam is who? Eve. That will fall out in the history of the unfolding of the text. She will come into being, will she not? Well, in the same way that Eve will come into being by decree, sin will come into being by decree from God as well. Are y'all hearing me? And sin will come into decree, come into realization because God gives a law. It is strictly clear that transgression of God's law is sin. Follow this. If God had never given Adam and Eve a law that had punitive damages as a consequence of their action, their actions could have taken place and it would not have been what? It wouldn't have been sin. Y'all keeping up with me? It's only sin because it's decreed. It's only sin because it's purposed. And because God is the first cause of everything, it logically and necessarily must be that sin starts with God. That makes sense. Now what Paul is about to argue is, if you don't believe this, you can't be saved. Because what he's about to build out is what we call the parallel and paradox of the first Adam with the last Adam. Y'all keeping up with me? Here's what he's saying. If you don't believe that the, uh, the uh, formulation of sin happened by God's decree and your first parent, Adam, in whom we all are, is the progenitor of a human race that's born in sin and iniquity, if you don't believe that, then you must necessarily believe that you've got to pay for your own sin. You must necessarily believe that because if we all are sinners, because the evidence is in, we do what? We die. Y'all will catch up with me. The evidence is in that we're all dying. But if you're going to argue that Adam's sin is not connected to my sin, then you got to deal with your sin yourself. Am I making some sense? Yeah. Right. I mean, for a moment, you get to do what a lot of children do, blame their parents for the sin. You get to do that with Adam and Eve right now. So hurry up and do it. Blame Adam and Eve for your sin. Blame your mom and your daddy for, this, for your sin. Blame them for your behavior. Blame them for your attitude. Blame them for your dis, discontentedness and all of that. Blame them because you only get about five minutes to blame them for your idiosyncratic ways. Because after that, you and I know the Bible says every one of us will have to answer for our own sin. Right, so even though you and I share the nature of sin in Adam, the consequences of our actions are on us. Am I making some sense? So there's a tension there that you got to get. The tension is this. The origin of my sin is in my father Adam, but the consequences of my sin are mine because I'm still individuated from Adam as a human being. Although I am in Adam in one way, I am in myself in another way. That subject-object distinction is necessary. I am from Adam, but I am not Adam. I do have parents, but I'm not my parents. That's liberating, isn't it? The other thing I taught you guys, you guys got a lot about your parents, but you have a lot on your own. God made you you. And therefore, whatever liabilities come with your connection with your parents, you still have the capacity to live up, out of, in front, and beyond their maladies and their weaknesses because you are your own individual person. All right, so it's good to hold that because even though you might say, whew, I'm so glad I'm not my mama or my daddy. Problem is, you might be worse than them. <laughs> okay, so we got to work that out. Because what if your parents are actually better than you? Which is not too far from the case in many situations. But suppose that is the case, that you are extricated from them. The problem is, is that you're still a sinner. And you can argue if you want to, but we're going to bury you one day. And you can put a flag up in the casket all you want to say, I'm not a sinner, I'm not a sinner, I'm not a sinner. Yeah, you're a sinner. We can ready to put you in the dust. You're going the way of all sinners. And it started with Adam and Eve. Am I making some sense? It's important, therefore, you and I to understand that when we're talking about the doctrine of original sin, 
there has to be a categorical distinction between the origin of sin itself and it appearing in the life of humanity. It entered in through Adam. Technically, and then Adam joined in, and they both fell, and the consequences only occurred when Adam ate. I taught y'all that. Have I not taught you that? It ended in really through the woman. And then the man loved her enough that he jumped on in with her. They both went to hell. That's right. And before they plunged deeply into it, God came down and rescued them. That's why you and I are here right now. Am I making some sense? Right, right. And that's because Adam 1 is really a figure and tupos and pattern, pattern of Adam 2, the last Adam. So this is what we're teaching in our Bible because this is what Paul is saying as well. The origin of sin is clearly laid out. And then what Paul is teaching is what God did was add the law throughout the history of humanity after we had fallen. Listen to what he says again over uh, in verse uh, 12, uh, 13, as we have it in Romans chapter 5. Notice what he says. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death did reign from Adam to Moses. It did, did it not? Over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. I want you to capture that because I just told you what it was. All of us as sinners sin differently than Adam sinned. Because Adam's sin was before the fall. It was in the garden. And it was in relationship to one exclusive, unique prohibition. A prohibition that God in his wisdom saw that you and I would not repeat over and over again. We did not have to. The fact that Adam is the federal head of the whole human race indicts us at the level of nature. So when we come out of the womb, we find another tree to violate. We find our own tree. You see what I'm getting at? So, I, you know, you can, call it a, you can call it an apple tree. It was not an apple tree to me. It was a fig tree, technically. Uh, but you can call it what you want to. It was fig leaves those brothers covered themselves in. Fig leaves. Since to me, I'm eating some figs. Oh, I'm in trouble. Let me put some fig leaves on. The fig leaves was big, too. And that's what God used all the way through Torah to teach righteousness by works. The fig leaves, they're on the temple as emblems of righteousness. But you and I are taught that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But what was Adam and Eve trying to do? Cover up their sinfulness with fig leaves and begin to work to obtain favor with God by what they do. Because they had no solution to their sin. Y'all got that? They had no solution. So you'll find the fig tree as an emblem of not only access into the temple as emblems on the doors of the, uh, of the temple and the tabernacle, but the fig tree is an emblem of national Israel as well. So Israel was always figured by the fig tree that goes into a deeper analysis of the typology, but it was a picture of righteousness by works. Israel was brought under the law. They were told to look for Messiah, but they thought that they could really just keep the law and get right with God. That is what Adam and Eve tried to do when they put on fig leaves. They thought God wasn't going to notice them. Hey, how y'all doing? Come on, let's sit down. And, and God was just going to overlook these big old leaves. <laughs> covering them. I mean, before the leaves, they was butt naked. Everything was cool. That's because they were clothed spiritually in the anointing of God that allowed them to operate in what we call probational righteousness. Probational righteousness is that God made man upright, but he was still under a law of obedience so that at the moment he disobeyed God's law, he lost the covering. So now him and Adam and Eve are what? Naked and ashamed. That's our condition spiritually. We are naked and ashamed without a covering. Am I making some sense? So the whole human race has the constant pathology and psycho-traumatic uh, experience of trying to avoid our nakedness, cover our nakedness, comfort ourselves in what we know are inadequacies in our life because we're not right with God. 
Now, God has a solution, and we're getting ready to come to it. But I needed to get this point for you guys, and that's clear. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's trans transgression. Adam is the figure of him that was to what? Good. Now, the point that Paul is making here is, in the same way that the whole human race suffered the consequences of Adam's sin. So in like manner, there is a new Adam, and his name is Jesus, which the doctrine of federal headship falls out the same way. Y'all ready to walk through it? I want you to see the beauty of the argument. Look at verse 15, verse 15 Romans 5, 5, verse 15. But not as the offense. What is the offense? The sin of Adam. But not as the offense. So what Paul is about to do in his logic is demonstrate that there are contrasting elements between Adam 1 and Adam 2, although they're both called Adam. Pastor, help me. Adam 1 is similar to Adam 2 in that they're both federal heads. That's why they're being called Adam 1 and Adam 2. You're going to see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 in a moment. So they have something similar. But what Paul is immediately starting off by arguing is that there is something different between Adam 1 and Adam 2, obviously. Because Adam 1 brought about condemnation. Adam 2 is bringing about justification. That's the contrast. The similarities are there for us to see parallels, but they are also there for us to see paradoxes. For us to see opposing laws, opposing rules, opposing outcomes. Here it is. But not as the offense, so also is the what? If, uh, if you have an outline and a pen, I want you to write down the developmental descriptival expression that Paul is going to use because he's going to build a ledger and design a distinction between what Adam 1 did and what Adam 2 did. Under Adam 1, you're going to hear the term transgression and the term sin. Under Adam 1, you're going to hear the term the disobedience. Under Adam 2, you're going to hear this constant theme that's described by the gift of grace. I want you to capture that, all right? You're getting ready to get taught some theology here. Watch what he says. But not as the offense, so also is the what? The first thing I want you to capture is that Adam brought an offense. The first Adam brought an offense that angered God. The last Adam brought a gift that pleased God. Make the contrast clear, okay? Notice what he says, the free gift. It's very important. That's one expression of what the last Adam brought. For if through the offense which came by the first Adam, many be what? Much more the grace of God. Add that. So first of all, it's called the free gift, but it's also called the grace of God. That makes sense because grace is a gift. Grace is a gift, and that gift is given how? Freely. The free gift of the grace of God. Y'all got that? You don't know, but that what Paul is doing is adorning Jesus with this language of grace and gift to help us understand the radical distinction between our fall in Adam and our recovery in Christ. It's a free gift of God's grace. And listen to it work itself out. It's not only called the free gift. It's called the free gift of the grace of God and the gift by what? Grace. Add that to the conundrum because what you're do dealing with here is not only the character of the gift, not only the character of the person of the gift, but also the character by which you get the gift. You get the gift only by grace. Y'all keeping up with me? The character is that it's a free gift. The character is that it is the gift of God. The other characteristic is that this free gift of God can only be given to you by grace. You cannot earn it. You cannot earn it. Catch up with me. It's a free gift. It's the free gift of God. It's the free gift of God's grace. And it's given to you by what? Grace. This is of salvation when the gospel is properly understood. Is that not so? For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man 
that is so critical to making sure you keep the gospel properly uh, communicated. Am I making sense? Notice what he goes on to say then, because I love what Paul is doing. He says then that this free gift, which is the grace of God, which is given by grace, which is by one man, his name is what? hath abounded unto many. We know this is true. That's the parallelism. So with Adam, sin has abounded to many. With Christ, grace has abounded to many. Let's walk through the next three verses because we're almost home, children of God. Notice what it says here in verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned. Who was that one? Adam. For the judgment was by one to what? The judgment was by Adam to the condemnation of humanity. When it comes to the second Adam, it's not condemnation. It's justification. Are y'all looking at that verse? You ought to be happy in your soul right now. Let me see what we can do here. By one condemnation came, but the free gift, which is the free gift of grace, which is given by grace, is of many offenses unto justification. So I could say right here, Adam opened the door to let sin in. Jesus opened the door to let sin out. Yeah. You and I are sitting on, so, so now you can know when you're hearing gospel preaching. When gospel preaching has you sitting on the sidelines watching God do all the work. It is not the gospel if you are engaged in helping yourself save yourself. When you feel like you're on the sideline drinking a Coke and, and eating some popcorn and watching what God is doing, saying, go, God, that's gospel. That's gospel. That's the gospel, okay? You must know that. If he called legalism, that's works of religion, okay? Because it's not by works that we do. We have things to do, but it has nothing to do with obtaining our salvation. You must know that. Follow the logic here now. So then what I love about what's going on, you see the tail end of verse 16? Our whole topic has been justification. Yes. Paul's argument is superlative. God is righteous, and he has a right to destroy humanity because of its unrighteousness. And he has a right to save humanity on the grounds of his own righteousness. And if he's going to save us on the grounds of his own righteousness, God has to prepare and demonstrate and affect a way of justification that cannot be refuted by humanity. So what you're looking at is the irrefutable work of Christ in justifying sinners by his own death. Are you hearing it? Walk with me a little bit more. Walk with me a little bit more. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. So, for if by one man's offense, death what? Death what? All right, so I, I'm with you, Paul. I know where you're going. You're going to Romans 6 and Romans 7. I need you to hear this. He's argued in Romans chapter 6 that sin, for the people who have experienced the grace of God, by the grace of God, which is a gift of grace, according to a gracious God, sin does not lord over you anymore. Y'all keeping up with me? That's our word for curios in a diminutive expression. When it says here sin reigned, it means it reigned and ruled over everyone until Jesus came. Yeah. It reigned and ruled over Adam all the way up to Moses, from Moses all the way up to Jesus, because what Paul is about to teach is the only way that the consequences of our sin could be dealt with is that the power of sin, the reigning lordship of sin, has to be completely abolished by a new Adam who can remove its reigning power in your life. Here's what he says. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive, I love this, Titus is another adjective, the abundance of grace. Now we're talking about the free gift. Now we're talking about the gift of grace. Now we're talking about the uh, grace of God. Now we're talking about the gift given by grace. Now we're talking about the abundant grace of God. Y'all see that? What Paul wants you to get is that when you draw a line between law and sin over against justification and righteousness, justification and righteousness infinitely transcends the effects of sin and transgression. They are not equivalent categories. Sin is so subdued by the grace of God and justification 
that you and I should be shouting for the triumph inferred in the work of grace given to sinners. This is what I said. I don't want this to be too far of an aside, but this is what I meant when I said earlier, you and I want to hold in tension how we see the world. We want to hold in tension how we see the world because Christ has been ruling since his coming and his death and resurrection for almost 2,000 years. And the world has been blessed infinitely by the rule of Christ because humanity has been living in the sunlight of the gospel and the blessings of the gospel across nation upon nation upon nation with a God who is now even more patient with human beings now that Christ rules and pours out grace to the darkest of sinners in every part of the world. God is patiently gathering in his elect because grace is abounding. Grace is abounding. Are you guys hearing me? Grace is abounding. For, he says, if one man's offense, death reign by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace. I better go ahead on and be evangelical. They which receive it, they which receive it, have you received the grace of God? Have you believed the gospel of his grace? Have you heard the message of redemption? Does it make sense to you that you're a sinner and the only way your sin can be dealt with is by the merits of Jesus Christ? Does it make you happy that God reconciles sinners, that God commends his love to the ungodly, that while we were enemies of God, Christ died for our sins? Those are God's sheep. God's sheep enjoy the gospel. We, I mean, for us, the gospel is more than joy. It's stupefying. Like, this is crazy that God would do all this for us. It's like, it's like stupendously crazy that he would do this. And I'm telling you, that's the joy, unspeakable, and full of glory that Paul talks about. I can't quite get my whole head around it. I practice every day to articulate the gospel, and it still defeats me every time I contemplate it. It's too wide, too broad, too deep, too high, infinite in its nature, superlative in its qualities, right? I'm like a little child going goo goo gaga, trying to explain the blessings of the gospel. It's so hard. But the goal of the Holy Ghost is to bring you to drink it like water so that even if you don't know its contents propositionally, you know the blessing of drinking in the water of life. If any man thirst, let him come after me and drink. For as it is written, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he was talking about the third person to help you enjoy Jesus. God hath poured into our hearts the love of God by which we are sustained by this message of redemption. Then notice what he says at the bottom because I need to get with Paul in terms of Paul's terminus goal. He says, therefore, if one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace of the gift of what? The gift of what? All right, so now he has modified the concept of grace and the concept of gift slightly. What has he done, Pastor? He has given us the substratum or the foundation by which now the gift of grace has the capacity to save you. What good is a gift of grace if that grace doesn't have the ability to completely save you? The gift of grace is the gift of Christ's righteousness. It's the gift of what Jesus did in your behalf. Remember, we're still talking about righteousness, are we? If in the previous verse the gift of grace was unto justification, it only follows then that if you have received that grace, you are not only justified, you have been made the very righteousness of God in him. Are y'all hearing me? We got one more argument to build because I want you to get it. We have one more argument to build. The gift of grace that you have received presupposes the accomplishment of justification on your behalf by the sufferings of Christ, or else it wouldn't be given to you. Why would God give you something that doesn't work for you? You need righteousness. Am I making sense? But that's because you know you are a sinner. That's right. What does a sinner need? He needs righteousness. Well, where can he get it? It's certainly not coming from himself. And the kind of righteousness you need is the righteousness that will pass muster with God. So it sounds like to me, if I'm going to have a righteousness that's going to work with God, it has to come from God. 
And that's what the gospel teaches you and me, that this righteousness comes from Christ who is our righteousness. Making sense? A little bit longer. I want to show you one more thing, and then we'll shut it down. So notice what he says. Not only does the abundance of the grace of the gift of righteousness is given to you, he's saying that righteousness shall what? Reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Don't go anywhere. You have not, you have not, we have not finished the court case in your own conscience. It's important for you to get this. Righteousness has a reward that necessarily and axiomatically, this is a sequence that follows righteousness because this is what God has promised and you need to know it. Anyone who is viewed as righteous in God's sight has eternal life. I'm going to drill down into that. There's no such thing as you having the righteousness of God and still being dead in your trespasses and sins. There's no such thing as you having the righteousness of God and not knowing eternal life. It's no such thing as you having, as it were, been examined by the courtroom of God's justice and have been proven to not only not have committed any sin, but having obeyed all of God's law, which is what the law demands. If a man does the law, he will live in them. All right, I have done God's law. In the person of Christ, I have kept all of God's law. All of Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. When God looks at me, guess what he says? Jesse has kept all of my law. Am I making sense? Stay with me. And not only have I kept all of his law, but I have paid all of my debt in terms of my sin. Because when Christ died for me, he died for all of my demerits, all of my rebellion, all of my disobedience, all of my grievance, all of my hostility towards God. He paid for my sin, and he gave me his righteousness. That is the gift of grace on the grounds of righteousness. When I come out the courtroom, my slate is not clean. When I come out of the courtroom where my legal defendant, which was the Lord Jesus Christ, remember I told you, you get a public defendant, his name is Jesus, he only defends guilty sinners. Have we talked about that? And he always wins the case. Have we talked about that? Jesus don't want nobody that's righteous. If you're righteous, you got to deal with God yourself. What Jesus will do is he will defend sinners, ungodly, rebel sinners. That's what he does. He has a system of getting you off the hook that works every time. He presents to the judge, which is God the Father, his own obedience, his own perfections, his own righteousness, his own sufferings, his own sacrifice, his own death, his own burial, his own resur resurrection, his own nature, his own nature. Because what he does for the sinner is trade places with the sinner. So that when God sees the ledger, when he sees the dossier, at the bottom of the dossier, a perfect obedience, passively and actively. Perfect suffering, pass passively and actively. Perfect dying, perfect coming under the wrath of God for all eternity. Perfect resurrection from the dead. When God looks at the bottom of the ledger, it's not Christ's name there. It's my name there and your name there. If you believe on him who took your place and died for your sins. Am I making some sense? This is called the stand in righteousness of God for hell bound sinners. It's called stand in righteousness. Y'all got that? Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believe. Not works. Believes. Yes. And the father says, oh, this boy only not have kept all my law. He has also paid off all his debts. That means he's free to go. And when we leave the courtroom of God's justice against us, stay with me, the law is not hunting you down to see which sin you're going to commit once you get out of jail. Did y'all hear what I just stated? Because righteousness not only follows you out of the courtroom, it follows you all the way to glory. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That mercy and goodness is found in Christ and given to me freely by his grace. Did y'all get that? Very important. Very important. Very important. Verse 18. The last one is verse 18. I want you to get it. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one. What's his name? The free gift came upon all men unto justification of what? God justified you in order that you might live. Give me five minutes. And it's important for you to get this. Christ didn't accomplish your eternal redemption and then leave you to die. He would have been sinning. If the law says, if anyone does this law, he now lives, then the reward of that law accomplished has to be applied to the person for whom it's imputed. Am I making sense? This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the what? And no one comes unto the Father by me, but by me. What that means is, when you have Jesus, you have life. You have life because you have righteousness. You have righteousness because you've been justified. You've been justified because Jesus took your place. And that life is spiritual life now and eternal life then. Am I making sense? Here's the point that I want you to get. When Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 31, if you are my disciples, you will continue in my word and you will know the truth. And the truth will what? Jesus was saying you will be free from the courtroom to live in the presence of God for all eternity because you and I have the right of life through the rebirth of the work of the Spirit of God in your life. In other words, when the gospel comes to you in power and you say, Lord, I believe that. Lord, I believe that. It means you're already born of God. Did you hear what I just stated? So I want, you to, I want you to get you to a lot of y'all babies. This is 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, 1 John 5, 1. You say, Lord, I do believe you. I want to know if I'm born again. Well, if you weren't believing him, you wouldn't be born again. And if you, didn't, if you weren't born again, you wouldn't believe him. Only born again people believe the gospel. Listen to me carefully. You don't believe the gospel in order to become born again. You don't believe the gospel in order to become born again. You don't breathe in order to live. You breathe because you're already alive. You believe the gospel because you're already born of God. That's what the text says. Did y'all see y'all Bible? Notice what he says. Whosoever is believing that Jesus is the Christ is already born of God. That's a perfect verb form in the Greek grammar. In other words, Faith is an evidence of life, not the cause of it. If you're walking around here trusting Christ as your Savior, it's because you've been born again. And if you've been born again, it's because he has given you his righteousness. And God now has to give you life. You and I have life, life in Christ. This is a glorious truth. This is a glorious truth. That's hard for you to believe. Because you are simultaneously righteous and, and there's so many other dreadful, uh, paradoxical, and contradictory experiences going on in your life. Am I making some sense? I'm going to close here. I want you to get it. This is Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Paul knows what he's saying because he's already argued, did all the heavy lifting in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. By the time he gets to chapter 8, he hopes you are persuaded that you're already alive if you believe Jesus. Am I making sense? He's hoping that you get it, because that's why Jesus came. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me, and I give them eternal life, eternal life, and they shall never perish. My Father is greater than I, and they will never be plucked out of his hands. And the whole point of the gospel is that the gospel brings life to sinners on the grounds of something somebody else did. And the glory and evidence that you have that life is that you believe this message. Are y'all ready? 
if you believe the gospel, according to Romans 8, verse 1, there is, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The prison doors are open, you're free to go, and nothing is going to hunt you down and drag you back into the courtroom and throw you into jail again. There is therefore now, not in the future, now, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Outside of Christ, no justification. Inside of Christ, no condemnation. No condemnation to them that walk after, not walk after the flesh, but walk after the what? I do not want to deal with it now, but Romans 8 is about the third person that walks out of that jail cell with you. He walks out with you, and he traverses the world with you, and he lets you know how free you are. Watch this now. Notice what he says in verse 2. This is what he says about this idea. For the law of the spirit of what? For the law of the spirit of life. So what is the Holy Ghost being called for you? Life. Didn't Jesus call himself the way, the truth, and the life? But it's the third person that brings Jesus' life to you. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me what? Has made me what? Free from the law of sin and death. Do you see now how the legal code has to open up the jail cell and let you out? And that you being out is life itself. It's life itself. Freedom is an evidence of life. Believing is an evidence of life. Am I making sense? The Bible's clear. If you do not believe on him, you will die in your sins. But those of us who believe are already alive. Those of us who believe are also enjoying freedom. Am I making sense? I just want to share a few more verses, and I know this is not solving a lot of your problem because your problem is an issue of perspective and a lack of depth in a knowledge of God. You need to go deeper in your knowledge of him. Because when Jesus said, whomsoever the Son shall set free, shall be free indeed, he means for you to walk in the fullness of that freedom across every area of your life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Notice what he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, notice this, for what the law could not do. Do you agree? In that it was weak through the what? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That was the work of Christ in your behalf. He came in your place and condemned sin. So now, sin is condemned in your life. That means it has no right to rule. If he condemned it, it doesn't rule. Now, sin is present in your life. Don't lie. I... I it just bothers me to no end when Christians say they don't sin. Please stop it. Stop it. Just the very words are sin. All right, so I will pick up that later. Here's the point. Hey, listen, please hear me now. The triumph of the Christian is not denying the presence of sin. The triumph of the Christian is not going around in some kind of postmodern fabrication of, if I say sin doesn't exist, then sin doesn't exist. Oh, yeah, sin exists, and it's present, and it tempts you, and it tries you. And sometimes you slip into it. But all of that is dealt with under the grounds of justification and righteousness given to you in the person of Christ so that the Spirit of God can help you with that. So imagine it like this. Sin is present with you, sin is present in you, but you are not dominated by that sin so long as you can trust Christ as not only the one who has given you his righteousness, but he will help you deal with the stupidity of that lying sin nature that says it reigns over you. You might as well take up Romans 6, 11, and 12 and simply say to sin, you no longer reign over me. You no longer reign over it. That means you got to go to war with it. I'm making some sense, right? You got to go to war. I mean, it used to look like it was your boss, it was your king, it was your master. Now he's a little peon. Sin's a little peon. But he's a harassing peon. And you only make him bigger when you forget who you are in Christ. Did that make sense? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit which is equivalent to walking after the gospel. 
The flesh is the law. The spirit is the gospel. The flesh is the law. The spirit is the gospel. You know you have the spirit when you know and love and embrace and depend upon and trust in the gospel. Final verse, I'm done. Look at it. Verse, verse uh, why did you shut me back down? Jashana, you know you are not going to get in it if you keep doing that. This is what is called a henna clause, in order that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, Christ came in the form of flesh to condemn sin in the flesh, in order that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in who? Pastor, what is that righteousness? I just told you, it's life. It's life. What is the righteousness of God? It's life. How is that life evidenced? By you believing God. How else does it show up? By you following God. By you trusting God. By you loving God. By you adoring God. By you obeying God. Not on the grounds of getting right with God, but on the grounds of already being a child of God. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? The life that's in you is the life of Christ in you, which is the hope of glory in you because of what Christ has done for you. Remember again, all that I am, he was for me. All that he is, I am in him. If he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, if Christ is in me, I'm already with my Father in heaven. So are you for which we cry, Abba, Father, because we're already alive. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to pay some bills, and we're going to let you go home. Uh, I will have one announcement I want to make before it's all over. All right, you guys can stand with me. There's a precious woman who has been part of Grace Bible Church for, since about 1999, 25 years. It happens to be my mom. Her name is Pearl Gistin. Uh, she lost her son yesterday morning which was my little brother, Richard Gistan. So I need you to keep my mother in prayer. I frame it that way because she's his mother, and that was her son. That is my brother, and we are full brothers. But I need you to pray for her. You can pray for me, but you don't have to because my heart is not sad. I have prayed for my little brother for about 10 years in the beginning of our work. Some of us know that. Prayed for my mom too. God saved my mom. Prayed for her. That's why you keep praying. Took 10 years for my brother to bow the knee. My brother had terminal kidney failure. So he's been on dialysis for a long time. That's why he doesn't come to church, but every now and then. We baptized him. Many of you guys saw me baptize him many, many years ago. Uh, a very humbling event, very humbling, because when you love your family, you want them saved. And, and you know, they don't understand that because they don't, they don't have the same glory we did. But the most important thing for me was that he, he became a child of God. He came to know the grace of God in Christ. Very important. Very important. 
So I'm not sad at all because he suffered a lot. When you have kidney failure and you're on dialysis three times a week, it's a slow demise. And uh, he didn't die any kind of suffering. There was no warning. He was putting on his clothes, from what I understand, getting ready to go to dialysis. He was sitting on his couch, as he usually does, in his bedroom, and the Lord called him home, just like that. Boy, don't, wouldn't you want a non-eventful exit out of, non, you know, <laughs> eventful exit out of this world? Wouldn't you want to just check out with no struggle, no difficulty? Yeah, that's, that's why I'm not sad. I'm very glad. A little jealous. He got his reward before mine. But you can hear, you can hear the other disciples. And Lord, we've been working all day long in, in the heat and in the sweat. That brother walked in here, get his ticket, and he out of here. That's because God has a purpose for all of us. Every day that we're alive is a day of purpose. And you need to thank him for it, because I do. I pinch myself. I could have been dead long ago, long ago. But my mother lost a real partner. You have, part you have partners when you struggle and suffering together. She'll be all right. She's a healthy woman. And uh, I know her. She's loving as can be. But keep her in prayer. We'll let you guys know when the services will take place. Everything's in order. My prayer would be that your house would be in order. When your, when your ticket is full. Now, I know y'all was rejoicing in the fact that you're going to never die and you got eternal life and all that's good, but you need an insurance policy too. Do y'all understand that? And I hear some of y'all saying even now, well, I'm going to be gone. I don't need to worry about it. Somebody else can worry about that. Well, we're going to put you in a U-Haul truck and ship you out to Central California out there in the desert somewhere. <laughs> I'm trying to let you know now, we're not going to spend $50,000 on you when you could have spent $20 a month on an insurance policy. I'm always reminded of that when, when our loved ones pass because it's just amazing to me how we act like we won't die. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord calls his face to shine broadly upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious as we heard today to you. And the Lord give you his total shalom, his total peace in Jesus our Lord. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.